my closet in the bay. So I'm very happy and excited to be here. I'm very happy to talk about the future, the fourth industrial revolution. I finally have a flying car. I'm excited, yes? You want a flying car? Get to go to Mars and visit it a little bit. I finally get the body and I'm always on it. Can't wait. I'm excited about the future. So I said I will do in-depth research, lots of research. So I watched one movie. And it's a lot of, a lot of research. Remember The Matrix? Have you seen that? Okay. Okay, that talks a lot about the future, what's going to happen, where we're going. It tells me everything I need to know. What happens to the humans in the movie? What, what do they become? Slaves. Slaves? Or batteries. We're just batteries, yes. So, in conclusion, my talk is finished. There's nothing we can do. We become batteries. Everything is, is done. My presentation is over. <laughs>
going to share two more articles from the New York Times. One article, laboring machines were afraid of displacing men and people with all of this, these computers. The president ranked this as a job, but this is an important job we need to worry about. So there's one problem. Let's look at the dates. June 1st, 1930. This one is from February 15th, 1962. We have been talking about automation robots for almost 100 years. We're still waiting for it to take over. It hasn't happened yet. Here's an article from 1928. They talked about concrete construction for buildings and roads. In the press, they were very afraid of cement and concrete. What will all these people do who cut bricks for a living to make buildings? We were worried about that 100 years ago. Sometimes we forget about the past a little bit. So we have several different industrial revolutions, steam, water, labor, electricity. Many different things have come from those revolutions. Many things we still use today. But what happened to all of those previous jobs? Many of these jobs disappeared. So let's talk about this. In the year 1900 in New York City, in the city they had 200,000 horses. They create manure. You didn't think you were coming to a conversation today about manure. <laughs> yeah. Got to make it a little exciting for you. But, but let's look at the map. That has to be cleaned up every single day 100 years ago. If you skip a day, hmm, doesn't smell very good. In 1880, 15,000 horses died. In many cases, they did not clean up the horses. They left them in the streets. That's how it was, 100 years ago. Yeah, now I saw that face, yes. <coughs> but we created so many new jobs, yes. Look at the new jobs. We had to grow hay. We had to sweep the streets. People's job was to take a broom, sweep the street so I can walk across. Otherwise, I step in the manure. That was a job. Wagons, horses, was that your job? No? That was not your job? No, okay. But 1908, cars arrived and people panicked. What will we do with all these jobs? These jobs will disappear. We don't think about these jobs anymore, do we? So what happens? New technology comes out, we hear about the lost jobs in the news, in the press. That's all we hear about. It's going to be horrible. The world is going to end. But what really happens? We get new tech suppliers, new industries. They generate new jobs. We get higher productivity, so we can expand our business, which creates new jobs. We lower prices, we buy more, makes the company expand, new jobs. Or we buy other things, which helps that company create new jobs as well. We don't hear about this, do we? We usually hear about what is going to be lost, not about all of the new things that are created. So many different jobs, it's hard to describe them today because we don't even know what they will be, but they're coming. Let's talk more a little bit about the car. What were some of the new technologies that came? Materials, cars, the fiberglass, tires, certainly our roads, streetlights, signs, they're all new since we created cars. Hotels, motels, vacation, restaurants, all these new industries that were created because the car was created. Many of these things were very small when the cars came. That's when this, uh, these industries increased. Let's do a little bit of fun math here. We talk about cars, driverless cars. Are you excited about driverless cars? I don't know, I can do work in the car a little bit maybe. Let's do the math. In Ukraine, 9,100,000 cars today. 
That is their job, hiring out. They store paper. They still grow. They grow 2% every year. Think about that. Paper usage is still very high. We're getting there, but it's, it's still very high. 50 years ago, we talked about the laborless kitchen. In the United States, it is now fashionable to have very large kitchens. They're supposed to disappear. I push a button, and there's my meal. I go to all the movies, all the TV shows. Now, the kitchens are, ah, oh, you must have the large kitchens. It's crazy. Let's talk about some more of the track record. Wall Street Journal is one of our newspapers in the United States. Every six months, they gather data and they say, is the economy going up or down? Not by percentage, not by amounts, just simply up or down. What do you think their track record is? Up and down. Yeah, up and down. <laughs> 52%. <laughs> and that's with all of the economic data in the world. Every six months, they can only predict it almost like a coin toss. They take a coin and put it in the air. It's about the same, 52%. Stock, stock market. Do people have stock in retirement? <coughs> so they said as a joke, let's take monkeys and throw darts at the wall to pick which company is going to go up or down. <laughs> yeah, how do you think they did? <laughs> they did better than the professionals. Now don't laugh, because if you invest money in the stock market, you're paying the other people to do worse than a monkey. You know, buy a monkey, they're cheaper. Stay money that way. Let's see what else. American football. Each division has four teams. So if you're going to pick the team who wins, one in, one in four, 25%. But you, we, we know who the bad team is, so it's really one in three. One in three chance of predicting the current team. Pretty easy. We pay professional athletes. We pay them millions of dollars every year to predict who's going to win. Quotes people said. 
unpredictable factors such as weather. No one else could have predicted it. Okay. My prediction was right. My timing was wrong. I think timing has something to do with the prediction. <coughs> this one I still do not understand. So maybe we translate it to Ukrainian back then. <coughs> The evidence was not incorrect, but was not fully predictive of what was going on. I still don't know what that means. People's fears do not add up. 80% of the people think robots will take 50% of the jobs. <gasps> Except, 80% of the people think it's somebody else's job. <laughs> so whose jobs are they? I don't know. So why are we so bad? There's such a strong incentive to make extreme pr predictions. They have to be original. They have to stand up. What's the name of your river out here? Nipro. Nipro? Yes. Okay, Nipro. If I take a little rubber yellow duck, I was out there yesterday, I put that on the river. There was no, no TV, no press, no news. <laughs> Somebody put a 30 meter rubber ducky, and everyone wanted to skip cameras there and see it. Lady Gaga, she puts a lobster on her head, everyone wants to take a photo of that. What's even stranger, all you have to do is make one crazy prediction, and it's right. You can make every other prediction wrong. The only thing people talk about is the one crazy prediction. Isn't that weird? That makes no sense. You only need to make one crazy prediction in your entire life. But I think anyone here from uh, Romania? Because what's our penalty here? Is there any penalty to make a wrong prediction? No. In Romania, though, see, I've read about it. They said if you make a wrong prediction, they put you in jail for two years. It's pretty smart. What do you think will happen to their predictions in Romania? Yeah, no, certainly should go down a little bit more. What happens to project managers? <laughs> exactly, there you go. There is the whole project management for now. They're working in a movie. Yeah, I heard they do have very good Wi Fi in the prisons in Romania. Yeah, very, very, they're very well connected. 5G. So, anyone who believes in environmental, I love this one here. Cave, cave people. Something's not right. Our air is clean, our water is pure. We do all of the exercise we need. We eat organic, free-range food, but nobody lives past 30 years old. <laughs> it's kind of funny, isn't it? Ah, uh, pyramids. I like pyramids. So we have pyramids and Cleopatra. You've heard of Cleopatra, I hope? The man walking on the moon. Except we have one problem with this photo. We need to put her over on that side because Cleopatra lived 700 years closer to the man walking on the moon compared to the pyramid. But what do we think about when we think of Cleopatra? We think of pyramids. <laughs> now, what's her nationality? Everyone remember her nationality? Greek, yes. Greek, she was actually Greek, not Egyptian. A lot of times we don't know what we think we know. Let's do a little more fun math here. Did you know we could take the entire world population, everyone, everyone around the world, we could all fit them in Ukraine, and everyone will have 64 square meters each. It's rather interesting. We hear about overpopulation, but when you kind of do the math, it sounds so bad. The United States alone, we can feed 9 billion people. We can give back the size of Ukraine to nature every year for 100 years and still have enough space on the earth. That's not what we hear about in the news, is it? Kind of interesting. London, we talked about how crowded London is. It took them 76 years to get back to World War II population. They were more crowded back 
in the 1940s than they are today. Berlin and Paris, they still have not reached the World War II populations. No. Except for the Chinese tourists. <laughs> Yeah, we don't count those yet. I've experienced that myself in Paris, yes. All right, let's have a little more fun with numbers. We have a list of things, and we have size. So 200 times 10 to the 6th, nice scientific math today. Let's see, what goes with 200 million? The number of insects, bugs, for every person. Each person has 200 million bugs. Where, where do you keep your bugs? I put mine in a little <laughs> box on the side. So two, that's how many insects there are in the world. 100 times 10 to the ninth, number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay. 3 times 10 to the 12th, number of trees on the Earth. 1, 2, 5 times 10 to the 12th, the number of synapses in a brain. 7.5 times 10 to the 18th, the number of grains of sand on all the beaches. All right, who's my science people here? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Anybody remember what that is? Avogadro's number, very good. Oops, wrong button. Number of atoms in a tiny little matter, little piece of matter. And then certainly the stars in the visible universe. It's kind of funny when we compare things that we normally do not compare. It's not maybe not quite the list you would have created. <coughs> All right. A lot of times when we make very irrational decisions, we make emotional decisions. We're very good at this. Lots of our advertising, ladies. I know this is true of shoes, yes. Right. If we have 100 euros for a pair of shoes, nobody buys them. If they were 200, they were in sale for 100. Yes, ladies, yes. Men, men, you're just as bad. You do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It, we're very good at comparing numbers. We're not very good at absolute numbers. So let me give you an example. This is uh, was still true with the economy, the Economist magazine. So the paper version. All right, I got 12 minutes. I'm going to say it wrong. I'm going to say it wrong. I got my sheet here. Gladian. Gladian. Okay, good. So 1,600 gladians a year. The digital web version, 3,300 per year. And our digital and web for 3,300. It's not a typo, it's the same number. 10% of the people buy the magazine, 90% buy web and paper. 0% buy just the digital version. Okay. Well, why do we need the middle one? Let's get rid of it. Let's cross it off. We don't need that one anymore, right? What happens to the numbers? 60, 40, it shifts. That doesn't make any sense. Well, maybe it's the economy, maybe it's something else, I don't know. Let's, let's put it back in. The numbers shift back to 10 and 90% again. In all three cases, no one buys the middle option. But yet, by putting the middle option there, it changes our perception of good and bad. It shifts our numbers. You will see, now that I tell you this, you will see this everywhere in advertising. There's typically three choices. Good, better, best. They want you to buy the middle one, so they'll give you something that's very expensive and something very cheap. So this one looks like the right choice. Or they'll give you something free to make it look even better. You'll see that every number word, and you'll see that wherever you go. I'm sorry. So where does this leave us? Why am I telling you all this? Right? The world is changing. It has always changed. We cannot predict the future. We're very good at predicting the future. We have to work together. That's part of what we need to do. That's what we're very good at doing. Interacting, communicating, solving problems, going to conferences. We need to continually learn. 
that's part of the value of what we need to do in our times, in our professions. Are we trying new techniques? Are we trying new activities? Or do we tell ourselves, we're too busy to learn, we're too busy to improve? We've always done it this way, why should I change? How many times do you hear that? Do you hear that work? Yes, no, yes. I hear it all the time. So, what has been new in our industry in the last 10 to 20 years? So, Agile, if you haven't heard about it by now, you probably need to know about it. If you have heard about it in our profession, we need to understand it. It's there, it's, it's, it's not going anywhere. And it is not the same as a project manager. It's not a different methodology. There's pieces that are very familiar, but it's also very different. It's changing the way that we talk to each other. It's having people talk to each other and interact. It's working directly with customers. It's responding to change as part of the process, not a separate change management process. We still need both sides, but we change the emphasis naturally. I'll just give you a total of 12 principles. I'm just going to show you six real quick, something to think about. We want to satisfy our customers early. That means smaller phases, more demonstrations. I can't imagine having a one-year project and the only time the customer sees something is after one year. Agile says, can we show you maybe every two weeks? Every two weeks we show you what's next. And, just, and then we can make adjustments every two weeks. As we get changes, we can make those adjustments, because every two weeks we can make small adjustments. There's definitely some value there. Sometimes in project management, we're too rigorous about, this is the plan, this is the plan, it cannot change. But sometimes we need to change, we need to build that in, especially in software. We don't know what we want, so we have to be able to adapt that change quickly. Talking to our business, what a shock that is. That's such a surprise. We should be talking to them all the time. We should be getting that feedback as often as we can. We also need more trust. Somewhere along the line, we've lost trust with our vendors, with our other companies we work with. So how do we deal with that trust? We write these very rigorous contracts and we can never change them. But we need to extend more trust. That's one of the things that Agile asks for. Sometimes the best way to talk and share information is to actually have a conversation. I have a three email rule. If we send email back and forth three times, I do not send the third email. I pick up the phone and call the person. Because if we can't figure it out in three emails, we're not going to get it five, six, seven, or eight. Pick up the phone, make the phone call. I've done that with CIOs at a company. Hey Bill, I need to understand this. Also, lessons learned. We do a lesson learned at the end of a one year project. Do we ever use it? We can't affect the project. Agile says we're going to do a lesson learned called a retrospective every two weeks. That's 26 times in the entire year. It gives us an opportunity to change and fix our process. Critical PM skills, project management skills. How do we communicate? How do we talk with each other? We should be spending 80% of our time interacting and talking with people. If your day is spending working on a schedule or working on status reports and sitting in a room, you need to be out talking with the team. Find out what's happening. How can you help them? What do we need to know? What do we need other people to know? It does not mean let's all gather and sit and come in a room for an hour or two hours. Let's just have conversations. We need to be short to the point, say what we mean, mean what we say. Use clear words. Stay away from jargon. Stay away from very long, fancy words. But first I want to take, I want to talk about something that's personal to me, if that's okay. So, Please indulge me for two minutes. There is this compound that's very, very nasty. Um, and I would really like to share this with crowds when I speak. Dihydrogen monoxide is called 
hydrogen, I know I can't pronounce that word, hydroxyl acid, there we go, causes burns, erosions, electrical failures, lots of problems. They have it in nuclear plants, it's in pesticides, it's in our food, it's in our houses. You shouldn't laugh, it's very serious stuff we have here. That's, that's not appropriate to laugh about this. They deliber deliberately spray this on organic crops. This is horrible. They dump it in the rivers. It's not biodegradable. It causes this to metal. We get, imagine what it does to our bodies. We can't breathe it, but it gets in our water. It's horrible. Water bottles on the shelf. They find after 30 days, they have a high concentration of the hydrogen oxide. Once you get it on your hands, you can't wash it back off. So really what I'd like to do is, would you mind signing a petition to ban the hydrogen monoxide movement? Anyone? No? Not one person. Thank you. Two, three, are you going to sign it for me? Excellent, thank you, I appreciate that. Because it's important, and it's really important to me about this horrible compound. <laughs> Yeah. So, yes, I have to be very careful. Yeah. <laughs> so, the hydrogen monoxide, a big fancy word instead of water. Let's go back and look at it. Water is literally sprayed on organic crops. Water is dumped into the river. Water causes rust to occur. You can't breathe water, how can we drink it? Water bottles have a high concentration of water after 30 days. You get water in your hands, you cannot wash it off. <laughs> Isn't that amazing though? Just changing the words, the impression it gives you. We do this all the time as project managers. We want to use the big, long, fancy words in our report. And, yes, of course we do. <coughs> <coughs> Why do we do that? I don't understand. We have some of the most confusing things that we write. And as I work with other project managers, I tell them, the longer you write, the less time someone will read it. No one's going to read that. They do not want a history of the project. We need to be able to say, in 10 to 30 seconds, someone can read the report and they know what, what's happening. This should be written to our sponsors, to our stakeholders, and tell them. I need you to do this. Here's what's happening. I need you to be involved over here. That's the value that we bring. Bringing the clarity. What risks do I need them to be aware of? What are the key issues? Let's be that source of truth of what's happening. Also, estimation would be an interesting thing here. So we have like eight million grave done to eight months or our estimate was A, the actual work is 10. What do we say to the project team? You did a bad job, you're over budget, you're over time. People think that you failed. Fire the project manager, we don't need them anymore. What if I gave you an estimate of 12? Oh, the team did great. Congratulations, they're under budget, they're under. But yet, the actual work in both cases still only took 10. That initial estimate is such a large component to success and failure of a project. So when you start a project, one of the first things you should do, check your numbers. Is it reasonable? Is it realistic? Or did someone give you a project you're probably not going to be successful at just because of this alone? They come back and say, you must do it in eight months. You must do it. Well, if it's not realistic, this is the problem that we get into. So, last couple of slides here. We still need to work with people. We have to build trust. Help me understand another key phrase. Should I try to say it? Should I try to pronounce it or am I going to embarrass myself? <laughs> exactly. I was about to say that myself. That was my, that was my paper. I can't say it now. Oh, what do I do? Oh, here it is. Say it where it is now. Dokomo. Jite, Rosu, Vite, Vita, 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 Vita,
We are, and this is a university professor, two professors. We are currently preparing students for jobs that do not yet exist using technology that has not been invented in order to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. Universities are changing and have changed. They're not teaching you a skill, they're teaching you how to think. Or they should be teaching you how to think and solve problems. Because that's our problem. We don't know what those problems are going to be. But that's okay. Also, be care of those predictions. You're going to read them in the press. You're going to read them everywhere. Don't assume they can predict the future any better than you can. But also, don't think you can predict the future that well either. I think I know I can. Many times, they're not much better than guessing. And typically, it's only the crazy, extreme, wild things of what you're going to hear and read. Once you realize that, you start to learn smart. That's all you're going to hear is the crazy things. Still comes down to how do we react and interact with other people. How do we work as a team? How do we communicate? Keep learning. Stay relevant. Find out what's happening in your industry. Find out what's happening in the, the areas that you work. That's what's going to keep you employed. That's what's going to keep you excited about the future. So we need to adapt adopt, and thrive.